asking the Lord, God, what's it going to take to see revival? Seeing men and women and children growing in faith, hungry for God's word, hungry for closeness with him. What's it, what's it going to take, Lord? What will it take to see people in our community coming to a saving faith in Jesus, being saved from the bondage that they're enslaved under, the, the, the darkened eyes filled with light, broken hearts mended and made whole. What's it going to take, Lord? You know that as your pastor, this, this, is, this is what I, I long for. This is what I pray for. For me, for you, for our sons, for our daughters, for our community. This is my deepest desire. And after, after contemplating on this and, and, and just spending time quietly before the Lord, quite a bit of time actually this week, um, I've come to the conclusion that it comes down to a single word. And that word, my friends, is alignment. Alignment with God. What would it be like across the board if we all came into alignment with the will of the Holy Spirit? What would our church look like? What would our community look like? after the effect of this in our midst. Now, when we look intently into the Bible from cover to cover, the Word of God is packed with lessons that have a very contemporary application. And regarding the issue of alignment, there are numerous examples throughout the Bible of what happens when God's people come into alignment with Him. And this morning I'd like to share with you the heart of God as spoken through His Word to Solomon in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Now, leading up to this, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, here's kind of the backdrop to where we're going today. We're told in 2 Chronicles 6 of how the first temple, the Jewish temple, had just been com constructed by King Solomon, and it was a beautiful structure. It was made with quality materials and craftsmanship. They poured everything into it. And, and, and this temple was, was a, a sight to behold, and, and it was in the process of being dedicated. And in this dedication ceremony, leading up to the opening of the temple, Solomon laid his heart bare before God calling out on the Lord on behalf of the people of Israel. Solomon's temple had a great deal of detail poured into it. And, you know, at that time, the building of that particular temple and the way it was constructed, everything that was done was done in alignment with the will of God. But Solomon, you see in this passage of Scripture, he understood that the beautiful temple that he'd constructed, it wasn't the point of it all. It was only a token or a gesture of gratitude to the Lord. And in Solomon's prayer in 2 Chronicles 6, 14, starting with 14, I'm going to read this. He said this, Lord, the God of Israel. There is no God like you in heaven or on earth. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep 
For your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him when you said, You shall never fail to have a successor to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all that they do to walk before me according to my law, as you've done. And now, Lord, the God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David come true. But, says Solomon, but will God really dwell on earth with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet, Lord my God, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open towards this temple day and night, this place of which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer your servant prays towards this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. What a prayer. What a powerful prayer. And this was done out of sincerity of heart. Sol Solomon went on to continue in his prayer of dedication of the temple. And his demeanor before God was humble. He humbled himself before God in his heart. And when he was done his prayer, because it was God's will that Solomon build this place for his glory... We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and they worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Can you imagine the power of that moment when you see, if you were there, to see the response that God had to this heartfelt prayer of Solomon? Solomon and the people of Israel were in alignment with God, and he answered. It wasn't though they were, as though they were looking for this. They had their focus specifically on the Lord, and God decided in his sovereign power and his sovereign will to answer in this way. It is a very interesting passage of Scripture, don't, don't you think? Very interesting. When Solomon and the people were in alignment with God, fire fell in the temple and burned up the sacrifices and offerings, and the glory of the Lord was so intense that the priests couldn't even enter the temple because the glorious presence of the Lord had filled it. Do you understand the implications of this passage, of what God is trying to say? The dedication of the temple brought visitation from God in the power of the Spirit with holy fire. The holy fire of God consumed the offerings and the glory of God filled the temple to the point where it was just thick. So thick. And the result was the prostrate falling down in worship before God of the people. Worshiping, saying, He is good and His faithful love endures forever. You know, sometimes I, I think that we're taught... That spiritual experience is suspect. And that God never really actually wills to give people powerful experiences because he doesn't want us to worship our feelings. And there, there is some truth in that. Don't, don't get me wrong here. Okay? But sometimes we, sh we shut off the tap and we throw the baby out of the bathwater. Solomon was not praying in 2 Chronicles 6 to seek an experience for the sake of experience. He bared his heart before God and humbled himself before pe the people he was called to lead. And as a result, God in his sovereign will, it was God's decision to do it this way. In his sovereign will, he called, he visited the people in that place in a powerful way, in a powerfully 
emotionally stirring way, I might add. He didn't have to send down visible fire. It could have just been simply the, he could have done it differently, right? The altar could have been there and all of a sudden, poof, there's a little puff of smoke and it starts on fire. It didn't have to, like, you know, it didn't have to happen this way. God did this because he wanted to stir the people and, and leave a mark and a, and, a, and a monument to say that I have, I have blessed this. You are in alignment with me. This is the way that I have planned for it to happen. And this is the start of my desire for you people. So powerful. The priest couldn't even enter the temple. Wow. You think about that. They couldn't even enter the temple. It was so powerful. The, the Shekinah glory of God was filling that place so much they, could, they couldn't. They would have been just like. <gasps> it would have stopped them right in their tracks. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and was and is to come. It bring, brings that whole throne room scene of Revelation to light, right? See. God is holy. He's powerful. And he can do what he wants. He doesn't have to do things a certain way. The only thing that he will never do is he'll never contradict his word. Never contradict his word because his word is truth. But there's things that God does that are kind of strange sometimes to us. Right? Or different. Or powerful. We don't know. But, okay. Let's move on. It was the Lord's will to move the temple of God from an external place of meeting, like this first temple that we're describing here, dedicated to Solomon, into the heart of man. The external places of meeting with God were established under the Old Covenant. We see the Old Testament lay out the Old Covenant. And now we're under this New Covenant where the temple was established through the person and work of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus, when he was born into the world, he was preparing to usher in this new covenant through the sacrifice that he would give on the cross for the sins of the world. And while he was walking in the world, he said a few things that are profound. And I, I, I'm just sort of turning, I, I need you to focus on, on this because it ties in with what, what we just read. Okay? When Jesus um, was walking the world, he he met a, a Samaritan woman at a well, right, in Samaria. And, um, you know, we know the story. She asked him for a drink, and he says, you know, if you drink, give, uh, if you ask me for living water, I'll give you living water, and you'll never thirst again, right? And then he proceeds to tell this lady all about her past and what, and what she's up to right now. And so, so her response to him is this, in John 4, 19 to 24. Uh, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. For you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is of the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is, is coming, and when he comes, he will explain all these things to us, everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Wow. Now Jesus, we see the establishment of the new covenant, right? He went on to give his life on Calvary as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And Jesus, God in the flesh, came as the sin bearer for the disobedient rebels that he had created. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Beautiful. Whoever would humble themselves and believe in him would be forgiven of their sins and would themselves become, what? Themselves would become a holy temple where God the Holy Spirit would take his residence and live within. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, 
Paul told the believers, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. Once you become a believer, you, your ownership trades over. You're no longer your own. You don't call your own shots. Now you, you are a child of God. You are a slave to God. And he says, what does he say about his yoke? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's a far sight better than the heavy, dark, troublesome yoke that the enemy of the people of the world, Satan and his minions, put on. All right? My yoke is easy. There's freedom in Christ. After Jesus raised from the dead, he visited his disciples. In John 20, he visited his disciples right after he raised from the dead to fulfill his purpose in making the believer his temple. John 20, 19 to 21. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Once Jesus had been raised from the dead, Jesus' sacrificial work on the cross was to sweep the house clean inside of the human being that believed in him and whose sins were transferred onto his shoulders. His atoning sacrifice consecrated and cleansed the temple and whoever would believe in him would be cleaned out from the inside in preparation for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. Because God cannot dwell in a sinful heart. The sin must be taken care of. It must be atoned for. And that's why Jesus didn't give them the Holy Spirit until he raised from the dead and had paid the price for sin. The blood of Jesus washes away all of our sins. Amen. This was the start of the church right there. A lot of people... Fast forward to Acts 2, and they say, that's the start of the church. No, the start of the church was there. The commissioning of the church and the ceremony to launch the church was in Acts. This was the, the, the dedication of the new covenant relationship. See, the old covenant relationship in the temple, the physical temple established by Solomon, that ceremony there, okay, okay, that prayer. In the New Covenant, there is a dedication of the New Covenant re relationship with God in the new temple system where the Holy Spirit lives in the heart of people. That was done on the day of the Feast of Pentecost. In the process of revealing His plan of salvation for mankind, see, God established these annual ho holy days around the harvest seasons in the Middle East. And you can find this. I, I'm not going to read these scriptures, but if you want to look them up and, and, and research this a little bit, Leviticus 23, 9-16, and Exodus 23, 14-16 talk about these feasts. But the Feast of Pentecost was also called the Feast of First Fruits. And this festival was known by several names that derive uh, from its meaning and timing. And, and it's also known as the Feast of Harvest. And we see that in, in the Old Testament. It represents the first fruits of the harvest gathered as the result of the labor of those who com completed the spring planting and now they were harvesting. And it was the harvest time in ancient Israel. Okay? Everything in the Old Testament pointed towards where? Pointed towards Jesus Christ. The temple system, everything in the Old Covenant pointed towards the New Covenant through the blood of Christ where God's, God would be the sin bearer for us. Where he would pay the price for us because of his great love for us. It would be a covenant to complete what was started in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is 
the uh, New Testament concealed. The, old, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed through Jesus Christ. See, in Acts chapter 2, we read, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Does this sound familiar? Start, start listening th through that, this, these ears here, right? Comparing what happened with the establishment of the first temple to the establishment of the new temple inside the hearts of people. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. People were gathered here in context with this from all over the place. Jew Jews from all over the lands because they were there for the feast of Pentecost, the feast of, of harvest. Right? There were different places they could hear the followers of Jesus speaking about the wonders of God in their own languages. And Peter went on to preach the gospel in power and, and, and over 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ on that very first day of, the, of the, the launching, the commissioning of the church. And they were the first fruits of the harvest to come of which we are a part. See, the dedication of the first temple, which was external, was accompanied by God visiting it with holy fire, consuming the offerings on the altar and the accompaniment of the glorious manifestation of His presence inside the temple. According to Leviticus 6.13, the priests of God were commanded to keep that fire that was initially started by God on that day when the temple was dedicated. They were commissioned in Leviticus to keep that fire burning continuously. And the books tell us that that fire in the Jewish temple was kept burning until they were carried off into exile in Babylon. And it was extinguished at that point. But the dedication of the first temple, um, one, one, one reason that the ongoing fire was so important is, is that it started directly from God. This was God's way of saying, this is my blessing. This is... The sacrifices that are offered here are blessed by me. This is mine. It's my fire. And I will, I will accept the offerings from this place. The fire on the altar served as a constant reminder of God's power. It was a gift from heaven. No other source of fire was acceptable to God. In the past, we see times where people tried to imitate the fire of God. They tried to take their own fire and offer sacrifices to God on their own terms. And what did it result in? It resulted in judgment. As a matter of fact, in Numbers chapter 3, verse 4, uh, there was this man named ne N Nadab and Abihu, these two guys, and they decided to uh, offer sacrifices on their own terms with fire that they had started themselves. It says, Nadab and Abihu, however, died before the Lord when they made an offering with unauthorized fire before him in the desert of Sinai. They had no sons, so Eliezer and Ithamar served as priests during the lifetime of their father Aaron. So, God takes this pretty seriously. It's his fire. It's his work. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's not something we create or make up. The Holy Spirit is a very real person, the third person of the Trinity. And the fire that is produced by him is his. It's not from man. You notice in, in uh, the legitimate temple fire, it represents God's presence, God's consuming fire. He will not accept unauthorized fire in his work of atonement and sanctification for the spirits of men. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Exemplified in the dedication of the first temple. See, after the consuming fire of God fell and consumed the off offerings on the altar, that's when it was purified and the glory of the Lord moved in. Consecrated, purified, 
the glory of the Lord moved in. Do you see the connection between the new covenant and, and this covenant of dedication to the temple? God's holy fire didn't destroy Solomon's temple. It consecrated it. It purified it. In the same way, the holy fire of God in the temple of the human heart is not destroyed by the fire. It is a purifying or refining fire. It purifies us. He will not destroy us like we've seen the forest get destroyed by forest fire, which burns indiscriminately, or a blast furnace where everything, absolutely everything, is consumed and melted down. God's refining fire comes to separate what is pure and holy from what is not pure and holy, from what is unholy. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, prophetically tells us of the day when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, would come to purify and consecrate as the temple moves from the old covenant place into the gathering in the hearts of his people. This has been fulfilled. It's been fulfilled in us. We're part of the new covenant relationship with God. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Malachi proclaims in this passage of Scripture, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. This is a prophecy of Jesus. Under the new covenant, when we offer up our lives in service to Jesus, we become a temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. We no longer live our lives just for ourselves, but for what? For the glory of God. We live our lives for the glory of God. It's true. God uses or leaves us certain things for our use. But we have no choice as to what we can keep in the temple of our hearts and what we have to take out, to, to the, to, out of the temple back to the altar. Everything that enters the temple in the old system, everything that enters that temple must pass through the altar first. Whatever happens... It must pass through the altar. We must first check with God about every one of the things that we bring into the temple that he's created for us to be. This is why we honor God with our bodies. Don't you not know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Honor God with your bodies. That's why God speaks so clearly about sexual immorality and bringing sexual immorality into our, into our presence. Because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and everything must pass by the altar. If God at any time says in our lives, your life, my life, that as believers in Jesus, if he says at any time, you do not need this thing, we should relinquish it immediately. If we cling to it and say, this is mine, then our heart, in our heart, we have forsaken the altar and we quench the fire of the Holy Spirit in us. The Apostle Paul tells us in Titus 2, 14, uh, 11 to 14, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say what? No to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and holy or godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from what? To redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. See, the Israelites, during the dedication of the first temple, were in alignment with God on that day. The first believers were in alignment with God on that day. 
in Acts 2. What were they doing in both occasions? They were waiting on him in prayer. They're, they're bringing up their supplications before God when the fire came down. There was a powerful response from God. In both cases, the Lord God was a consuming and a consecrating fire, making holy the temple. In the first case, it was a physical temple on the outside. In the second case, it's the spiritual temple inside that God designed to make so he could be close to us. God's design was to be close to us. At atonement, you know what that means? At one minute. Atonement, at one minute, closeness with your God, intimacy with the Creator of all things. We're invited to this. He's consecrated us. Like the, the Levites of old, we're called to maintain what's happening on the altar of our lives, to maintain the fire. So Solomon and the people of Israel had been given this holy fire of God. They experienced the power of God filling that temple. The believers ex experienced the same. We too are set apart and consecrated to the Lord and purified from our sins when Jesus forgives us, when we, we, we take him as our Savior and we believe in his name and we confess him with our mouth, we are cleansed and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is deposited inside of the cleansed temple. And then we become a place where God dwells. And we have that closeness. We have the opportunity of that closeness with him. But here, when it comes to this, we enter a valley of decision. Every one of us has this valley of decision. It's a daily thing on how we're con to continue to live our lives, right? We've got a decision to make. We've got decisions to make. God, God, God tells us this. He gives us the capacity to make decisions. It's written in Deuteronomy 4, 23 to 24. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he has made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Later on in our text from 2 Chronicles 7, God speaks to Solomon and he advises him of how he would choose to be involved with his people in the temple. In verses 11 to 15, Solomon, it's written, So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. Then, it says in verse 12, Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayers and have chosen this temple as a place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. You see? You see the crossover? This is the physical temple he's talking about here. We're under a new covenant. You are the dwelling place of God. At the time, God told Solomon that he had chosen his physical temple as a place to meet in. God was aware that his people would have a propensity to Wander away from him. Ever wandered away from intimacy with God? Closeness with God? Wandered? All of us, right? There's times where it's tough and we don't respond the right way. And we need to ask God. Jesus Christ is our advocate. 
He's, he's, he, he speaks to God in our defense, and His blood cleanses our sin, and, he, and if we confess our sins, He is just and able to forgive our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness, right? That's what the Scriptures tell us in the New Covenant. Okay. Well, in Solomon's day, when they wandered away from him, when they pushed away from the table and they started doing things their own way, what did they experience? What did God say? He experienced, they experienced great hardships, didn't they? And God said that he would send these things to them for the purpose of discipline, to turn them back to him. Then when the people who were called by his name recognized the error of their ways and would humble themselves before God and pray and seek his face, in other words, when they came into alignment with him, he would hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal or restore their land. Great lesson. First Thessalonians to the, to the believers in the New Covenant speaks this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-23. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's possible for us through our behavior to quench the spirit, to cool. This is where in the Revelation it says, return to your first love, right? God calls out to one of the churches, return to your first, because there's a propensity for us to wonder. And when we wonder, we get our eyes off Jesus and we start doing things that quench the spirit. What happens when, when that happens? We see God discipline us. God's discipline co comes out of love, but nevertheless, to correct something, to bring us back into alignment with him. Hebrews 12, 5 says this, And you have, completely, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? Notice this, encouragement, that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Under the new covenant, we're God's temple in our heart. His altar is in our hearts. And Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. He's the high priest. He is everything. He fulfills it all. And the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at the right, right hand of the Father in the heavenly, heavenly realms, all, above all power and dominion and every name that can be named. He is above all. The same Spirit that l l raised Him from the dead is the Holy Spirit that lives where? In you. And the fire that comes from the Spirit is not yours. It is the Lord's. It is God's. You are His. You are purchased with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies as an act of worship. This is altar maintenance. In verse 7, uh, the writer of the Hebrews continues saying, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had fathers who disciplined us, human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They, are discipl they disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we might share in what? Share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So like all, most, I should say, most stories in the Old Testament, in the physical 
uh, circumstances of those stories, just like I've read here in Second Chronicles. There's most definitely a spiritual application to be applied to us both individually and corporately here today. In Solomon's day, God chose to permit human beings to construct a physical temple where he had agreed to meet with them and accept their sacrifices. Today, God meets the believers who have come to him through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus lives inside of us, right? Amen. Jesus paid the price of atonement for our sins, bringing us at oneness with God. If you're a true believer, the Holy Spirit has come and made his home inside of your heart. And he is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. He will not allow us to get away with putting things before him. He has his way of disciplining us to bring us back to where we are in alignment with him. The call today is if you have wondered in your spirit, if you've allowed things to come between you and God, and it's taken out your intimacy with God and your closeness with Him, then today is the day where you need to bow before Him and say, Father, I recognize that I need to repent of my waywardness, of my stubbornness, and all other misses that we have, because we've got a ton of them, right? And Lord, I'm asking you, create in me a clean heart, oh God. You know? But he's not going to take his Holy Spirit from us because his Holy Spirit lives in us. The Spirit lives within us now. The Old Covenant, they met with him exterior. New Covenant, he's within us. Therefore, therefore, Hebrews 3, 14 to 16. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the assurance we had at first. As it has been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and rebelled? Were they not all that Moses led out of Egypt? And finally Hebrews 12, 29 and 20, 28 and 29 says this. He says, Therefore, since we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Amen.